Hi, everybody. Um, hello, wow. This is a very chipper crowd for 8.45 AM. <laughs> I wasn't sure I was going to see anyone out here. This is great. Um, so if you're in the wrong talk, please don't leave, because I promise this is going to be interesting. Uh, this is Google Blocks. Um, we're going to talk about a few things today. When we were asked to give a talk about blocks, we had a few angles we could have taken. Uh, we thought about talking about you know, our approach to modeling and how we mess with 3D geometry and so on. That may be of limited appeal. So if you've got questions about that, come grab us afterwards. Um, we could have talked about uh, the performance challenges of making a high-end VR app that allows for pretty much unlimited creativity. But it might have made me cry to relive all of that. So uh, again, feel free to ask us questions afterwards. Um, but instead, we're going to give just a brief overview of, of blocks, what it is, what it does, and then focus more on the models that you can make with blocks, uh, the models you can download that others have made with blocks, and how you can bring them into Unity, what you can do with those. I think echoing some of the keynote yesterday, um, having access to rapid prototyping tools has been, for us, very uh, instrumental, I think, to our success in most of the internal things that we're doing at Google. And with Blocks, we're trying to make that accessible just to everybody else to kind of empower the developer community that's making a whole bunch of great stuff. So probably should have started with this. Uh, I'm Ian. This is Bruno. Um, we're both uh, software engineers at Google working on, on Blocks. And let's get to it. So most of us, if we're creating some kind of 3D game or app, maybe it's VR, maybe it's AR, maybe it's just on a phone or desktop, um, need some kind of world to put our, our characters or our models or, or something in, you know? And however good your physics engine or your storyline or your AI, uh, if you don't have any objects in your world, it's going to be pretty hard to test anything, pretty hard to ship anything. It's probably not going to be a compelling experience. Now, that said, I do love text-based games. But uh, for those of us who don't want that, we, you know, we needed something more. And again, our personal motivation at Google was you know, we love prototyping. So this is the sneak peek behind the scenes of some really crappy demos we made. Uh, this was back when our mission was, what can VR do for productivity? And, you know, and we, we very blandly interpreted productivity as you know, Google Docs, Google Sheets, these things. So we said, wow, what if you, you know, lying on the beach and writing a Google Doc? Eh, that's fine. What if you could see spreadsheets in VR? That's not that exciting. Um, presentations in VR was pretty cool. Meetings in VR was pretty cool. Uh, this one on the mid-right there, organizing your Google Drive in a 3D world, that's terrible. Um, but the only way we found out that you know, these were good or these were bad was you know, building them, play testing them, getting people to use them. And uh, this one on the bottom right is actually my very favorite. We did a whole blog post about this you can go read. And this was training people to use the espresso machine in our office using virtual reality. Because that was the first thing we did when someone came to our team. It was like, oh, hey, let's show you how to use the coffee machine. Press this button, turn this lever, tamp this, don't do that, do this. And it's a whole bunch of steps. And you know, people would mess it up and make bad coffee. And so we built this whole interactive virtual reality training experience. And people learned far better how to perform all of the steps in VR than they did from watching a video, than they did from even an in-person instruction. Now, they still made bad coffee, but they were really good at doing the steps. Um, but this took you know, uh, a modeler on our team more than a week to make this espresso machine and bottle of milk. And you know, he was game for it, but it wasn't a great use of his time. And really, we didn't need you know, this professional Maya model we just needed something that looked and felt and had about the same dimensions as the coffee machine. Um, so this was kind of where we got the impetus to build a modeling app um, in almost direct contradiction to, hey, we should build some productivity tools in VR. Um, and then I think the other question I get is, you know, why does, I guess, like Google care as a larger picture? And we, we want AR and VR to succeed. You know, I've, I've put a, a few logos here. Um, I'm sure someone in marketing would kill me for the way I've arranged them. But uh, you know, these are just a few of Google's efforts in, in VR and AR right now. And I'm sure we'll have more. And I'm sure plenty of other people will come out with other efforts. And I don't know what's going to succeed in terms of hardware or platform, in terms of AR versus uh, VR versus mixed reality. But I do want it to happen. And Google does want it to happen. And we want to be there when it happens. And really, if there's no content or no access to content, it's never going to happen. 
there is some access to content already. There's some great stores. There's some great resources. Um, but we didn't find much that empowered creators who uh, are like me, uh, basically lack a lot of you know, modeling experience or artistic talent to generate their own assets custom on demand very, very quickly to give an asset to a real designer to touch up and say, here's what I want, versus you know, me drawing on a whiteboard and saying something like this. No, no, no. And that goes on for two weeks. Um, and so that's really where we came from. And so well, apparently I had a script I was meant to be following here. Uh, making 3D objects is, is tough, right? Um, I've used you know, Maya, Blender, Max, and I've failed at all of them. Uh, the first thing I do is I make a mesh that's completely invalid and has some holes in it. The second thing I do is forget which hotkeys I'm using and accidentally close the program. And you, know, you, can, you can train on this, and you can get good on this, and people you know, make entire careers and professions out of this and do a great job. Uh, and we just want to add something above and beyond that for everyone else. And the professionals, sure, they can go and use blocks and sketch something up, and then export it, bring it into Maya, bring it into Max, and you know, do their magic with it there. I'm actually seeing a lot of people take that use case, which is uh, you know, very uh, reassuring for us. So. Blocks, making models, 3D models in no time. Great. Uh, it's an app for the HTC Vive and Oculus Rift. Uh, we have it in a booth downstairs if anyone wants to go and get some hands-on experience. Uh, it was made with Unity. Uh, we're very grateful that Unity took away so many of the headaches for us and gave us a couple more. But um, no, I don't think we would have been able to put this together with the size team we had without Unity. Um, and so. Within blocks, you have five basic primitives, a cube, a cylinder, and so on. You place these out in the scene just to rough out the basics of what you need. You can paint, uh, I say textures. We have some glass, some crystal. We give a very limited color palette. And then people come up to me at a booth and say, hey, guys, if you need some help, I could make a bigger palette for you. Um, and we really tried to restrict the, the palette and the look and the feel so that any blocks object made by anyone will look pretty consistent and we'll have that right feel. And if you know nothing about color theory, you'll still get a fairly good looking object. And the real power comes in, we let you go and grab faces and edges and verts. And if you know modeling, we let you do extrusions and subdivides and the majority of all of the basic operations you'd want. If you're a real pro modeler, you might come in and find something that you wanted that we don't have, but there's normally a workaround and you can normally get close enough to anything you want with a bit of practice, but mostly trial and error. And our benchmark is, if you know what the word vertex means, you're probably already too advanced to need this for more than just roughing things out. Uh, and then finally, uh, we, we strongly encourage everyone to sa save to the cloud uh, to publish their models. Our default publish flow is you know, Creative Commons remixable. And so we want to get this uh, remix chain going, this community going, where people can just riff off each other's models, download models, use them in apps, and so on. And so we put that as a first class citizen within the app for you to just go and grab. Uh, I think someone grabbed this motorcycle and made it into a cool Transformers robot. I was like, sure, go for it. Uh, and finally, so there's this, this web front end. We'll, we'll talk a bit more about that in a bit. Uh, and then finally, once you get these models, export them. They, don't, they shouldn't just live in blocks. You know, It's kind of fun to be in VR and make a thing, but really, you're going there because you want some model, normally. Some people just do it for fun. Uh, and so people do all kinds of things with it. We have uh, integration with Tilt Brush now, which if you haven't seen it, is a absolutely beautiful kind of um, VR artistic expression app, um, also out of Google. Someone made this entire skyline in box and then painted it and really brought it to life with fog and light and Tilt Brush. Um, this was made by our, our product manager, uh, Britt, down there, and I think her second or so week on the job. Um, you know. Never made a model before. Use blocks to sketch these out, and then we just you know, rendered them with a couple of basic Unity lights to get this cool underwater scene. So, uh, blocks models. I'll give you a few of the properties, and I'll hand over to Bruno to tell you how you can actually do something with them. So first off, they are, or at least should be, uh, low poly. It's pretty hard to get a high poly object in blocks, but I guess if you click and click and click for a couple of hours, you can get there. Um, but by default, everything is, is low poly. So it both has that aesthetic, those nice, you know, clear, flat faces. But more importantly, it should be very performant in any phone or VR or AR kind of experience. Uh, and if you've ever tried to import some, you know, super high poly, beautifully smooth assets into a phone app and then press run, uh, you'll know what I'm talking about. 
too. They are generally visually consistent. This limited color palette, this low poly look and feel, and honestly, the fact that we have these five basic primitives, and sure, you can deform them any way you want, and we see, you know, professional box modelers take a single cube and start reshaping it into an entire beautiful horse, but generally, you'll see a lot of our primitives crop up in these objects. So these marshmallows on a stick are just our basic cylinder, and so things tend to look very consistent. The benefit of this is you can drag and drop any number of box models from any number of creators, and they should kind of look like they're from you know, the same asset pack or the same look and feel. And so mixing them together can be very easy. Uh, and free, who doesn't like free? So I say free. Um, this is mostly just a, a byproduct of the fact that our default publish flow encourages people to use this Creative Commons attribution license, which is feel free to go and grab my model, use it any way you want for any purpose, but just give me a shout out, because you know, I spent half an hour making this thing. And finally, I didn't manage to fit this into a, a pretty slide, but they are available in uh, a whole bunch of file formats. And we, we really went out to the community and asked them, what do you want, what do you want? And everyone's got their f favorite file format. Um, but between these four, I think we managed to hit pretty much every use case people had. Um, GLTF, super nice for the web. FBX, great for importing into other creative tools. And OBJ works anywhere. So. With that, I'll let Bruno tell you what you can actually go ahead and do with these. <clears throat> All right. So I'm Bruno, and we're going to talk about developing stuff, because developing stuff is fun. I've been developing stuff ever since I was a kid. So I remember that when I was like 12 or 13, uh, my friends and I would get together on the weekday nights and also on the weekends to like make games. And we would come up like, with some basic program. And we would have like, these fantasies that we were going to create like this epic dragon and like crazy graphics. But the reality of things was often something more like that. Sometimes you could apologize for the bad graphics by just renaming things. So it's not a dragon, it's a slug-like thing. It's much scarier, at least for us. Uh, so yeah, so that's the, the, the kind of thing that, that we did. Um, if you think that uh, apologizing for graphics, that I couldn't get away with it in my professional life, I think if you think, oh, that's just my personal projects. If you think that there's no way that, for example, I could have made a game about a cube that shoots other cubes in order to defend bigger cubes with cubes in the background. If you think that there's no way that's a thing, I introduce you to Cubic Pilot. <laughs> I actually launched this thing. And Google, in some official capacity, actually uh, launched it. <laughs> Not only did we publish it to GitHub, somebody actually made a build of it and uploaded it to an app store. <laughs> and the best thing about this is the description that they had to come up with, because they didn't put any description in the project. So they came up with. Cubic Pilot is a basic game cubic shooter, <laughs> which is actually surprisingly accurate. So my point is, we've all, we have all been there. As developers, we have all read this book. And we have all been in that situation where we have to use the standard Unity cube uh, to stand in for a bunch of things. So needless to say, I was very happy when Blocks launched. Uh, because like Ian said, uh, because of our uh, Creative Commons licensing, this means that as a developer, I mean, as a talentless artistic developer, artistically at least, uh, I mean, it means I actually have a bunch of objects that, I, that, that are ready to use that I can import into my project. So instead of having my, my dragon, I can have this one, which is a little bit better. Uh, and this one's called Final Quest. So I can just, th this model is free. I can just go into the site and download it and then use it in my app. All I have to do is credit the author. Much better than this. So let's talk about how you go about importing these objects. So if you go into the, the Blocks Gallery site, so that's a collection of everything that people have published from Blocks. All you have to do is search there and find something interesting. So let's say um, I go to this website and I find this interesting city called The Long Tomorrow. Uh, I'm making like a sci-fi game. Let's say I like this city. So all we have to do is click on it, and then we see this, this view. Uh, I, can, I, can pan, uh, I can pan the view around with the mouse. I can navigate with uh, ASTW. And once I'm happy that I want this scene, uh, you might be thinking, wouldn't it be great if there, were, there was a button that allowed you to, do, to download it? So I have good news. There's a button called Download that allows you to download it in OBJ format. Actually, it's not just OBJ. It's OBJ plus MTL. Initially, uh, when I was preparing this talk, the original title was Importing Blocks Models. That was going to be a boring talk, because I was going to say, hey, my name is Bruno. I'm going to talk about importing Blocks models. So you grab the model, uh, you drag it, 
and you drop it, and that's it. Right, questions? Um, so e-porting is actually easy. Yeah, sure. You just like drag and drop, and it's in Unity, just because Unity makes things so easy. Uh, but I'm going to talk about some of the techniques that you can do. I mean, I'm going to talk about one of them, uh, just to show you the power that you have because of blocks models, because blocks models are so consistent. So usually when you import a model, it also comes with the materials, right? So normally, uh, if you just start dragging stuff into the assets folder, like I usually do, you end up with a few files, and then you drag something else, and you end up with a lot of files, and then you continue to drag stuff into the assets folder, and, and then it's a mess. So what I normally do is separate the assets folders into materials and models. Uh, whenever I, I import a blocks model, what I do is I create a new directory for that model. It's like the long tomorrow, and then I drag and drop into that directory. Unity will very helpfully create the materials directory with the materials for those objects. Now, uh, initially, when I started playing with blocks objects, what I would do is I would create a new directory for a new object and so on and so forth. So I would end up with like 400 of these directories. Each of them had their own like materials. But actually, if you look at blocks models, uh, each mo uh, all of the blocks model actually share the same materials. Uh, like in that palette that we were showing, it's actually the same 26 materials for all objects. And this is an, an, uh, an incredible advantage to you, because first, it's a very consistent visual style. And second, you actually have all the materials available to you, and you, you can tweak them. Uh, so for example, uh, so it, actually, in order to do that, you have to actually put all the materials in the same place. So what I usually do is I pick up every, every time I import something, uh, what I do is I take the generated materials from the materials folder, and I just move them up into the global materials folder. Because the way Unity works is the next time you import something that uses the same materials, it's going to reuse the materials from, uh, from that directory because the default setting is recursive lookup. This means that you can import as many blocks objects as you want, and they're going to reuse the same materials if available. And every time Unity creates a new materials folder, that's because there are new materials that you don't have yet, and you have to drag them over into the materials folder. Eventually, you're going to collect all 24 materials. That can be an, an interesting goal. Uh, catch them, collect them all. So once you have all 24 materials, this means you can import anything else you want uh, from blocks, and you'll never have to worry about materials again. So in this screenshot, you'll see that I have, in fact, collected all 24 materials. Thank you very much. Uh, and now that we have all 24 materials in the same place, this means that we can actually tweak any material that we want, and that's going to reflect on every single object that we imported in the whole scene. So as an example, again, I have no artistic skill whatsoever. All I know is how to, how to click buttons. But I'm going to give you an example of clicking buttons, which I did randomly until it looked good. So what happens if we want to tweak one of those materials so that I get more of like a night scene? I didn't actually intend for a night scene, but it came out that way. So suppose we take that yellow material, and now we click on the, we just turn on emission to make it an emissive material. We set the color to an HDR, like bright yellow. And then we also set the, uh, the home auto to be static so that we get the nice, uh, the nice light baking. So what will happen is this I accomplish with like three clicks. So notice the original scene, how it comes with the standard box look and feel. And look at what happens when you just tweak one material. Now I have this like nice night mood uh, in this scene. So I accomplish this with, three, with, with like three clicks. Imagine if I actually knew what I was doing. <laughs> so just like that, there are so many things that you can do with box models. Uh, you can do animation, you can do rendering in, in, in Unity, because once you import, it's just an object. You can, you can do anything with it. You can timeline it. You can do anything you want. Uh, there's this example of switches and gears made in blocks, and they're animated in Unity. Uh, there's this one, which is very FOMO-inducing. Uh, it's a, an entire block city. And the fun fact of, about this is that it was made by a 14-year-old modeler named Alex. Fun fact number two, it was his first week in VR. Uh, there's also Motepoat, which uses, is entirely made up of blocks objects. So they made the objects, they published it to the site, and then they downloaded OBJs and imported it into Unity. And here you can see the consistent look and feel. Like these, these objects were not necessarily made by the same person, but they all look well together. Uh, there's a VR student that created uh, an app called Fun with Trains. Uh, Mindshow integrated uh, blocks characters, so you can actually import blocks characters. Uh, VR chat holds events where all the avatars uh, are made with blocks, which is pretty fun. You can also, uh, there's an interesting combination now, which is you can use blocks objects with uh, AR core. So if you've been checking out AR core, 
Uh, it's a really, they go really well together, because you can, like, blocks, low poly blocks objects are perfect for, for AR. So you can like, place those objects there and do a bunch of interesting things. Um, what else? Oh, more, more examples of AR core with blocks objects. Uh, there's also direct integrations with the blocks gallery. So if you look at Modbox or Hologram, you can actually pull blocks objects directly at runtime from the, from the blocks gallery directly into the app. So this means you can like, build rooms and build environments um, out of blocks objects. Some people have 3D printed blocks models because one of the things that we do in blocks is we try to make it easy for the user so we automatically detect that meshes are valid. So we never let the user do something that would make the mesh invalid. Uh, so this is one of the pain points uh, that users have in other modeling tools because it's very easy to make an invalid mesh. And then, of course, you can print it, and sometimes you can even import it into anything else. So uh, one of the things that Blocks does automatically is check that the mesh is valid. This means that unless you do something really crazy, uh, your mesh should be 3D printable. So uh, a lot of people have 3D printed their meshes. And oh, and we did, uh, this was actually a, a prototype that we did uh, a few months ago called VR Escape the Room. So in VR Escape the Room, we just made a full room made of uh, blocks objects, and we made a puzzle that people had to solve you know, in, uh, to escape the room. Um, fun fact, we, the first person that we gave this to, and they said, oh, you have to escape this room. What they did is they just walked out of the room with the VR headset. And then, yeah, it's like, oh yeah, you can do that in VR. So, the next person that played it, we, we were cl more clear. We said, we have, you have to solve the puzzles to escape the room. Everyone in the team actually pitched in and, and made a few objects. Even I made objects for this game. I made the back wall. Spoiler, it's a cube. Just kidding, I'm being modest. I actually made all four walls. Um, recently, there has been a really fun trend in blocks, which is uh, making kits. So some artists have made kits for others to use. So for example, this is the bots with blocks kit. So they created uh, essentially like a tray of parts uh, that, you, that you can use to build uh, your own robots. So all you have to do is import that tray of parts and then combine those pieces together and then you can create your own uh, robots. And it's, in, like, it's amazing how many different robots you can create from, from those parts. So check out the uh, bots with blocks hashtag if you want to see some examples of those awesome bots. Uh, there are other kits as well. Oh, this is an, an article about it. So there are other kits as well. Uh, for example, this is a monster kit. So if you're ever, if you're ever thinking, uh, I would build more monsters if only there were more parts available. So this is the kit for you. You can, you can import it into blocks and then make your awesome monsters. I may even try this one day and actually make a dragon. I don't know how that's going to come out. There's also the, the knight kit. So you can put together those parts and then make some awesome looking knights. Uh, and this is a very interesting trend. It's much easier to build uh, these things with these kits than, than from scratch. Uh, so this is the URL. And I encourage you to go there and make something that's fun. Thank you. We're going to be around after the talk. We also have a booth downstairs if you want to come talk to us more. Uh, anyone have any questions you'd love to shout out? Go for it. So was it our vision to have people create kits? And no, that was completely unexpected. No. Nope. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, and, and where do we see it going next? I mean, we're really just listening to the community at this point. Um, you know, we're, we're giving this out for free, and so we have no real agenda beyond we want developers to be you know, happy and successful and make cool stuff. So if you have things you would like blocks to do, come tell us. We'll, we'll triage them and get to them. Um, I don't really know where it's going to go. I'm just happy people are using it and having fun with it. Yeah, the main thing, we just wanted to create this ecosystem where people can create things and then remix. Uh, and then build on each other's creations and, and see what, where it goes. Different. Mm -hmm. okay, good question. So if you want to animate those models. Uh, so right now when you export the model, it's just an OBJ model. Uh, you would have to, to do the, the rigging in some animation package. Uh, but then you have, you have basically the mesh. All you have to do is rig 
uh, the meshes with, with the skeleton, and then I can animate them. Some people have, uh, have actually made this. And uh, we had a prototype, um, I think a few months ago, that there was a blog post about it, about animating blocks models that, that did exactly that. Yeah. Check out the Daydream Labs blog post. If you Google some combination of animation, Google blocks, uh, you should find it. We don't really have plans for a non-VR version of Blocks. So, so with Blocks, we really just took advantage of the fact that you have six degrees of freedom. You can you know, walk and move around the space to get rid of a lot of the limitations that come with the, the keyboard and mouse kind of inputs. Um, and so I think you know, there probably could be something we could do on you know, the desktop or tablet side around making some easy to use, can't go wrong, developer friendly tool. But honestly, I think that uh, once you're on a desk computer with a keyboard and mouse, there's so many modeling apps out there already. I'm not sure we can add significant value to that ecosystem beyond you know, the, the wealth of you know, Blender tutorials or, or other like tablets and desktop apps that are out there. And so VR was somewhere we saw that there seemed to be a hole where we could you know, contribute something fairly meaningful. And there, I think we'd just be competing with a bunch of other tools. And honestly, I'd rather just help those tools succeed. Yeah. But you don't have to have VR to, to benefit from what Blocks gives you, because even if you don't have a VR headset, you can still go to the Blocks website and import any object that anybody has created. So even if you're a developer with no VR headset, uh, you have a bunch of objects that are available to you. So I, I believe the Microsoft MR headsets are going to support Steam, in which case, great, this should just come for free. If we have to do a bit of extra logic to make it work with their controllers, great, happy to. Um, for us, if it's you know, small work on our end and large impact for people who can use it, why wouldn't we? So when you, when you import an OBJ, it actually comes down uh, whatever groups you had selected in the, in the OBJ will come out as groups in the OBJ, I believe. And then you can split them apart in Unity if you want to. Yeah. In, in OBJ and FBX, we preserve the grouping the artist or the author used. In GLTF, we have a, a render batched grouping for performance. Yeah, because GLTF is optimized for rendering. So in GLTF, we try to optimize to, so that the developer can make as few draw calls as possible. So it's not necessarily grouped the way you, uh, you had it. But in OBJ, yes. Yeah. Uh, so crediting creators, how hard is it for you as a developer to make sure you do the right thing by the license? Um, right now, you have to keep track of everything. Um, we're trying to find ways to make that easier, embedding information in a zip file and so on. Um, honestly, it's hard because once you take that OBJ and you go import it somewhere else, it's kind of out of our control. So we're doing what we can on the help and advice and maybe even some tools or extra files. Um, but it's tough for us to enforce that you respect another author's you know, copyright. And so I think the main thing I do is I just use the word Creative Commons attribution about five times in every talk. Um, and then we put it all over our site and, and we try and help people do the best. And yeah, if, we're, if we're ever working directly with a partner, we make sure to, to get them to use it. Yeah, what I normally do is when I download a model and I import it into a folder, I just create a text file with the name of the author and then a link back. And then when I'm done with the project, I just collect all the text files and make an attributions uh, screen. All right, I think we've got time for one more question from someone new. <laughs> or someone old. Yep. <laughs> Not old, but you know. What's version two? What's version two? You tell us. Uh, right now, we're working on a whole bunch of ways to make um, alignment work better, just so that you can make everything perfectly flush um, with minimal effort. We have some tools for that already. We just want to make those more accessible, more discoverable, because that's something we've heard from the community. Beyond that, we're you know, listening to community feature requests. And that's what we're going to do. And we're very, very active listening to feedback on, on Steam. So yeah. if you have any feedback, yeah, make sure to, uh, to give us there. Great. All right. Thanks, everyone, for attending. Uh, Thank you. We'll be around after the show, and we'll be downstairs. Thank you.